I can trace my earliest memorable interaction with a fish to the age of four. <laughs> and in all fairness, you can't really call it an interaction given that we were fishing <laughs> and given that I cried bitter tears of regret for the entire rest of the afternoon. So it clearly wasn't the emergence of my career as a fisherman, but it might have been the emergence of my first thinking as an ecologist. Because if you stretch your imagination just a little, that's pretty much what I do today, 21 years later, as a conservation biologist. I worry about fish <laughs> quite a lot when I study their populations and how we monitor changes in them over time. But I can say that at least that incident gave my parents a fair amount of warning as to where my life was going to lead. So perhaps it's more accurate to call my second encounter with fish an interaction. Because about a year ago, I had just graduated with my master's in conservation biology. And what do biologists do for a holiday, to take a break? Well, we go help other biologists with their research. So I went up to the Titikama Marine Protected Area, which is one of our oldest reserves on the coastline. And on an afternoon off, we went snorkeling. And as I was kicking away from shore, I was kicking my fins out and I became acutely aware of the sensation of being followed. And for those of you who are surfers and divers, you'll know that that is, is a sensation that you want to take note of when you're in the wild. So with some trepidation, I glanced behind me and what I saw took me completely by surprise because as opposed to the toothy character I was expecting to see trailing me, there was a ragtag little mixed shoal of fish, curious as to what this human was doing bumbling around in their world. Now, by way of some context, the kind of stories that have inspired me to go into the career that I'm in, that deal with ocean interactions, tend to involve a soulful conversation with the dolphin, or a gentle heart-to-heart -heart with a whale. If you're lucky, a playful afternoon with seal pups. And I so wish that my research career could be attributed to just such an interaction, but my life had to take a much more quirky stance than that, and so on that afternoon when I was hanging in the water, suspended in Tsitsikama, and I stared through my goggles at those little fish, and they in turn stared, goggle-eyed, right back at me. And in a mo moment of brazen boldness, one of the little fish actually darted forward and nibbled on my fin. And that experience taught me several things, not least the value of our marine protected areas, because given the length of protection of those waters and the fact that those little fish never really leave the bounds, They'd never encountered humans as anything but benign in their waters. But more important to my talk today is what it reminded me about our childhood capacity to be surprised, to learn, to be in awe of what nature offers us. In short, our capacity for wonder. Because I have to say, that is at the very root of my decision to follow a career as a scientist, which was stems from a childhood spent lying on my belly in my garden trying to decipher bird calls because it was like learning languages. It's like suddenly being to able to unlock doorways and realizing that you can move through life with a much more connected, wider view of the world. But you start to realize, of course, that there are places on this planet that are trickier to engage with. And whilst I've spent most of my life completely infatuated with Africa's wildest spaces on land, it's taken me a good lifetime of beach holidays, three degrees at university, lots of diving and snorkeling and surfing, to realize that fish can be fascinating too. <laughs> and that they can prove to be characters as wonderful as the buffalo and the baboons and the ter termites that I've uh, studied before. So, I'm here today to share with you a little of my current research. Not, thankfully for you, in all of its statistics and graphs, so you don't have to panic, you don't have to engage our brains anytime soon. But rather in the stories that I've uncovered, the reminder that I've had about why I do the work that I do. So, here's to the science, because we have to get through a little bit of it. Um, in order to maintain our fisheries and ensure that they're well regulated and to make sure that our coastline is well protected 
that we have a sustainable fishing industry, we have a sustainable ocean resource. We have to monitor changes in fish populations over time. We have to understand their numbers and their diversity. But to do so requires a fair amount of logistics. So scuba diving is labor intensive, it's, it's quite expensive. Controlled angling surveys where we operate with catch and release, tagging fish, measuring them and then releasing them again are by their very nature extractive. And so therefore not ideal. But the advent of underwater cameras suddenly takes science away from the realm of Jacques Cousteau and puts it into the hands of scientists and allows us to view the life beneath our waves. And now this is why we have to win the rugby today because actually the Aussies beat us to the development of this. And Australian Institute of Marine Science has some researchers that developed baited remote underwater video surveys. And essentially it's a very simple concept. You lower a, a rig to the sea floor in the field of view of a remote controlled camera sits a little bait canister, you can see it there on the screen, and in that canister is a kilogram of sardines which proves irresistible to the fish. And then you film for an hour the life that swims in front of the camera. You haul the camera to the surface after an hour, you go home and you analyze those data from the comfort of your armchair with a cup of coffee. But of course, in South Africa, our coastline is challenged by very scarce resources spread over a long coastline. So we needed to find a way of doing this in a more cost-effective manner. So we started using GoPro cameras. You know those little sport cameras that everyone started realizing they could film to film themselves looking like Kelly Slater on a wave? <laughs> so we launched a project in False Bay last year to pilot this idea. And False Bay, as South Africa's largest true bay, is an icon in itself, but it makes a fish nerd's heart tick because it has this incredible marine diversity. In fact, it's over 41% of the fish species that you find in that region are endemic to South Africa, which means they are found nowhere else on the planet. And so False Bay sits between Cape Point and Cape Hunclip, and it represents this region of overlap between our two major currents, the cool Benguela, which moseys up our west coast, and the warmer, faster Agullis, which races down our east coast and makes it a very nice diving destination. And so what happens in False Bay is that we have a mixing of the cooler west coast species and the warmer south coast species. So it makes it an interesting place, makes it a place of interesting paradoxes too because where there are fish, there are fishermen. And commercial fishing can be traced to the 1600s in False Bay. But of course it's not just fishermen who operate out of there. It sits bounded by this growing urban community. And that's exciting for a conservationist, of course, because a lot of those are ocean users, from surfers to divers to paddlers to the Navy to the fishermen to holidaymakers. So it's an interesting place. And of course, as a scientist, I use my data to help us inform conservation planning, to help us understand and contribute to a growing body of knowledge. But that's not what captivated me about the project. Something, in effect, that was much more simple than all the stats and graphs really tugs at why you do this. And that was because I learned that we don't have to wait for wonder. It's not something that we have to travel to remote and exotic locations and be awed on the peaks of mountains. It's not something that we lose our capacity to appreciate as adults. It is most oftentimes found right on our doorstep. And I've learned three things. First of all, that wonder doesn't have to be something austere. There can be a lot of humor to be found in marveling at our oceans. And key to teaching me this has not been a fish, it's been an invertebrate, but a very clever one at that. One that is determined to get to our bait canister every time we put them on the ocean floor. One of the cleverest invertebrates in the ocean is the octopus. And they will try, they will stop at nothing to get at that juicy tidbit which we put in the bait canister. And often that involves them having to do several things. Tackling sharks, which they clearly don't mind, Sometimes it involves them tackling another octopus, which also doesn't deter them, as long as they're going to get that treat. And sometimes it requires them taking from the researchers to feed other fish, a la Robin Hood. So this character that you see on the screen here had unclipped the cable ties that tie our canister to the rig, and then it ripped open my octoproof bungee cord that I'd used, and you'll see in a moment, it does this wildly philanthropic thing. 
it flings across the bait canister, doesn't take the sardines for itself, and leaves it for the fish and rock lobsters to eat. Now, that's not a scientific fact, that's just fun, but anyway. And this is my favorite character here, who decided that actually researchers were a new form of Mr. Delivery. We were offering a wonderful service in False Bay, and decided that takeouts were a way better idea than dining out. So, <laughs> tried to drag that rig all the way back to its little posse on the reef. <laughs> And I sat and watched this for about 20 minutes. So if anyone says studying fish is boring, I show them this clip. But the second thing I learned, or that false faith taught me, is that wonder precipitates introspection. If we're able to marvel at the fragility of our environment, then surely we're able to, to understand the gravity of the responsibility that we hold as custodians on this planet. That's candy stripes fish over there is a red stump nose. And we used to hear of them in their hundreds rising to feed from the walls of Colt Bay Harbor. Now I see them in maybe one or two single individuals visiting our cameras. Those are West Coast rock lobsters. And yes, seals enjoy a delicious West Coast creof snack as much as we do. And although they're comical to see on camera like that, with a population at less than 3% of what it originally or should be, putting animals like this on camera is less about entertainment than it is about informing and understanding their conservation status. And I have to say, the third and final thing I've learned is that wonder is the substance that binds us to something that would otherwise be intangible. And I can see people's expressions when you see something like this and you gasp, or your face is surprised, that awe, that learning, that's kind of like taking the bait on a fishing line. And once you're hooked, nature slowly reels you in. Which is pretty much what she's been doing for my entire life. Now, I've always thought that the accumulation of knowledge is all very well, but it's in its application and in our sharing of it that it finds its real value. And as a scientist, you very quickly learn when you're trying to communicate your findings that people aren't very interested in the story unless they feel some connection to it. And if it's hard to communicate that connection to our ties on land and in rivers, it's so much harder to do so in the ocean. Which is perhaps why I keep my, mor my morale up by talking to kids so often, because they have no problem delighting in novel things. They also have no problem in telling you how little they know about the ocean. And sometimes they have no problem in telling you just how much they know about the ocean, which is another thing entirely. But I think that's the challenge that I would take upon myself and put out to you today is to connect with that wide-eyed inner four-year-old. That day that I was snorkeling in Titsikama, drove home certain points. First of all, of course, that a world without wonder for those of us who love to explore is almost inconceivable. But more importantly, that it's at the root of exactly why it is that we do what we do. Not just scientists, not just biologists, but any curious human being. And I'm the first to admit, scientists often find it very difficult to articulate why it is that we do what we do. And often it's our childhood heroes who say it best. It's always our heroes that say it best, right? And one of mine is Dr. Ian Player, who's a conservationist best known for his work in conserving South Africa's rhino population. And he writes, after reading the works of Lawrence van der Post, one of South Africa's famous writers, he writes, the story revealed to me that which I felt to be lacking in the understanding of my work and could not articulate. Africa had soul, and my soul was linked to it. In the wild places I had worked in and tried to protect, the ancient soul of Africa still lived, and parts of people could connect with it if we dropped our veneer and our arrogance.